The year was 1789, well over two centuries ago in Springfield, Massachusetts. His origins were unknown. Perhaps he came from lines of Welsh Cobb, Arabian, Thoroughbred, or Frisian. No one knew for certain. What was known was that he was a stout colt, a handsome colt, and so he was given the name Figure. No one could have known that this unassuming colt would become the cornerstone and foundation of one of the most outstanding and versatile breeds found today. As the colt developed, he was described as being small, but possessed deep muscling in his quarters and shoulders, straight, clean legs, expressive eyes, a well-arched neck, a clean throat latch, and short pricked ears. When Figure was two years old, he was given as payment for a debt to a colonial school teacher named Justin Morgan. He probably intended to make a quick sale of this colt, but as he put him to work, his ability and reputation quickly started to grow, eventually becoming legendary. Though not as large as the colonial workhorses, and not as tall and long-legged as the racehorses of his day, Figure consistently outperformed all of them. But as legendary as his personal feats were in his time, he became especially recognized and known for his prepotency. His ability to pass his genetic qualities and his attributes to his offspring so much so that he became the foundation stallion for the breed which bore his owner's name. It was his courage, substance, kind heart, broad versatility and prepotency which established his permanent place in history and has carried his legacy through 200 years to today and probably well into the future. With the birth of figure, the Justin Morgan horse well over 200 years ago, the Morgan horse is truly America's first breed and interestingly enough has contributed greatly to almost every other American light horse breed while retaining the attributes that made the Justin Morgan horse legendary in his day. Those who know the breed will tell you of its exceptional courage, kind and willing disposition, versatility, and heart. An excellent youth horse, a horse that captures your imagination and leaves hoof prints on your heart. So a few weeks ago, I was reading the Rutland Herald uh, on a uh, Sunday, and there was a story about the history of Morgan horses and how they first became established in the state of Vermont. And Vermont is sort of, I guess you could call it sort of like the epicenter of the American Morgan horse. And so I'm really delighted to have with us today the executive director of the American Morgan Horse Museum in Middlebury, Vermont, and that's Amy Mencher. Thank you for being with us, Amy. And also joining us is the president of the American Morgan Horse Association, uh, which is actually in Shelburne. The museum is in Middlebury. The headquarters is in Shelburne, and that's Jeffrey Gove. Jeffrey, thank you for traveling to be with us today. My pleasure. So, uh, so, uh, why don't, uh, Amy and Jeff, why don't you describe to our viewers how Justin and Mary Morgan facilitated the development of the American Morgan horse. And they, uh, apparently, they went through some turbulent times in Connecticut and Massachusetts, Massachusetts. before they uh, discovered their niche, so to speak, right? Well, yeah, and um, it talks a lot about Vermont history and how the state was founded and how people ended up moving here. Um, Justin Morgan was from um, West Springfield, Massachusetts, and he was one of many children, and um, he wasn't going to inherit much. Um, the way that land kind of got divided during that time was that it was split up between the male heirs, and so he was getting like one thirteenth of his um, of his parents' farm, and it just wasn't going to cut it. So he started doing other things to make a living. Um, one of the things that he did was um, he did raise horses, um, he taught school, he was a tax collector, um, and 
And around that time, this is in the 1780s, around that time, um, the U.S. government was just kind of getting off its feet after the revolution, and they weren't printing enough money. And so when he went around to collect taxes, what do you think his respo the response he got Absolutely from people? Absolutely not. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and so he was actually taken to court and was told, you need to pay for the, you know, what you were supposed to collect from people. And he said, well, I can't do that. You know, we're, we're in really financial stress here. So... At that time, Vermont was just opening up. It was still frontier. It was, Vermont didn't become a state until 1791. And um, in the stories of people who first came to settle here, a lot of people came and they were so shocked that they turned around and went home because it was just so frontier. And, um, and but he decided he would do it. He had some relatives here, um, you know, there was kind of, uh, migration between those towns in Massachusetts and Connecticut and Vermont and so he had connections um, and he came here and um, he didn't have any ho or he didn't have Justin Morgan figure as we call him we kind of interchanged the names he he was originally named figure and then later he was renamed the horse was renamed after Justin Morgan but um, it he was actually owed a debt by a relative and uh, the debt was paid in the form of the horse. And so they got this horse and he brought it up to Vermont after he had already settled up here. And people were just scoffed at this horse. They said, what is this horse? This horse looks different than any other horse. What is it? And he um, quickly, Justin Morgan, started seeing how much this horse could do, that it was very uh, tractable. It could learn many different things. It could be used driving. It could be used plowing. It could be used uh, carrying big heavy loads of stone, um, logging. A workhorse. A workhorse. Yeah, that's what the Morgan was. And so um, before you knew it, people started saying, well, I want to breed my horses with this horse. I want to, and, and over a span of about 30 years, the breed started. And, and this is, uh, when, you know, when we talk about breeding and all, this mm -hmm. is, uh, what, a, a, a poster, right? Right, it's a, it's a, a smaller version of a broadside that was from the 1830s, 1840s, um, of a horse named Green Mountain Morgan. And he kind of became the prototype of what um, people thought the Morgan should look like. And he was actually shown at, um, you see he was from Williamstown, Orange County, Vermont. But he traveled all over what was then the United States at state fairs, county fairs, being shown off and saying, this is the Morgan horse. Um, but he would be um, held in stud at different Available farms. for breeding. Yeah, available right. for breeding, right. yeah. Right. And people, they would advertise that. And, and farmers, you know, uh, Hill, Hill Vermont farmers were, could make a lot of money by offering that service. Je uh, Jeff Gove, there are some questions about the origin and the breeding of the Morgan horse as they descended from England or Holland uh, or sent to Canada by Louis the Fourteenth, mm -hmm. right? I mean, uh, Amy could probably speak to that better than <laughs> I know. can. She's studied it, and quite frankly, I'm more of a businessman than a historian. <laughs> so, Amy? okay. Well, um, you know, there's still a lot of. Um, mythology and, and unknown, yeah. and we really don't know exactly what the origin of figure was. Um, we know that his father, um, his sire, was uh, a horse, a thoroughbred horse named True Britain. And he would, had actually been the horse of a British officer during the Revolutionary War. Um, so, you know, the story of the Morgan horse, really, of this first horse, is really an American story. It's really a unique American story of, you know, and, and then they say that his mother, um, his mare, was of wild air breeding. And um, I, I think that that basically means that she was out yeah. <laughs> to pasture, and they didn't really keep track of who. Um, but people, when they breed, the, they think that she was may have, may have also been Arabian um, or a mix of different breeds. So today, when people look at the Morgan horse, they can see in it in its genes and you know the way the face is shaped and the way you know the way the body is shaped. They can see lots of different breeds of horses within that one. Mm -hmm. 
Je uh, Jeff Gove, how was it that the association, the, the whole United States, came to be created and headquartered in the state of Vermont? Well, I think that's basically attributable to the fact that the, for many, many years, Morgandom on the face of the earth was in New England. And I think in most people's hearts, it still is. And, uh, and particularly with Justin Morgan moving to Vermont and settling here and the original breedings all being done here, it just seemed like the natural way for it to occur. The largest aficionados were here in Vermont. Right. Um, there was a man named Joseph Battelle, and he lived in Middlebury. And he played a huge role in the development of the breed because he started the register. And um, so he researched about 100 years after Figure um, lived. He started going back and saying, OK, what happened? Who were all these horses in between Figure and where he, when he was living in the 1880s? Um, and, he, and so he put that all together. He went on research trips. He went to Florida. He went <laughs> to <laughs> the Caribbean. He went all over doing research about what happened to these different horses. Um, and then he put together the book. <coughs> so there's today, there's uh, over 20 volumes, or, and it's online really? now. Really? 20 yeah. volumes? Yeah, yeah. Because so. it's between 1789, um, when Figure was born, and today. Uh, Jeff, hmm. how many Morgan horses exist in the United States or the state of Vermont? I couldn't tell you specifically in Vermont, but there's probably about 90,000 living registered Morgans today, I think, is the correct number. And, and the globe? What about the globe? I don't know. We've just opened the registry to a bunch of um, other countries. Um, who, did we, who have we included lately? I think um, Sweden. <laughs> Yeah. Sweden, uh, yeah. Germany, yeah. they actually do quite a few shows in Europe. Now. Really? Yes, yeah, so shows in Dedicated uh, to Morgan horses. Correct. Yes. Really? Yeah. really? And there's a there's a Australian Morgan Horse Association. Yes, there is. Really? really. Um, yes, and there is. I get I get their newsletter. So it's always fun when I open up my mail and there's a, the postmark from Australia. And <laughs> what would be some of the uh, the these 90,000 uh, Morgan horses in the United States, the more populated states? What, what would they... Uh, As you would expect, the larger populated states with humans have the larger populations right, uh, of Morgans, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Michigan yeah, New York, yeah. California. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, before we started, you were telling me about a very uh, elaborate validation system and credentialing system that's run by the association, right? That's conducted. Can you it's tell really our viewers? Of, sure. I mean, there's a lot that goes into this. Well, there is. Um, all to be a registered Morgan today, you have to be DNA tested and certified back. It used to be done with blood typing. And how many years ago did we discontinue the blood typing. It wasn't all that long ago. I'm not sure. Yeah. 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 It, it was like probably 20, in the 20, 30 years yeah. maybe. I don't think it was even that, that long. long. Yeah. Yeah. So, but today it's all done by DNA. So there's no getting around it. You either meet the criteria or you don't. But uh, I mean, uh, so a uh, person has to submit this uh, DNA test uh, correct. that's provided by the association. Right? For a fee. Correct. So, yes. um, and then that gets registered and logged and... Correct. Right? It's, a, it's all done by UC Davis. The testing is all done by UC Davis. That's uh -huh. correct. Uh -huh. um, so, I mean, how did you get involved in the uh, Morgan horses? And uh, what motivated you? Why not, uh, I don't know, uh, Palomino horses sure. or whatever? Well, right. this, is, uh, this is probably a very typical story. It actually was because uh, my youngest daughter at the time was six or seven years old. My wife would correct me if she were here. And uh, she looked up one day and said, I want to take riding lessons. I said, yeah, okay, this will last a long time. <laughs> so we, uh, we took her down to a local farm that was only about three miles from our house. And it just so happened that that was a Morgan farm. Uh, Chris and Larry Cassenti's Chrysler Farm in Raleigh, Massachusetts. Um, Brooke, as it turns out, uh, went on to win a whole bunch of world titles. And so she's won a, just, I think, five or six different world titles showing in uh, our uh, Grand National World Championship Morgan Horse Show. So it, uh, it's not something that just fizzled out after five or six weeks like I thought it would. <laughs> and because of her, we wound up developing Taylor River Farm and the um, horse farm that the Gold family now owns, where we have 60 stalls and do a couple of hundred lessons to the public. 
every week. <laughs> so you've really uh, been bitten by the passion or the, the, the bug, so to speak, with, with this, right? Yeah, very much so. I mean, it all started with the horse and the kid, uh, but you really fall in love with just beyond the horse, with the people that are associated with the breed. They're just a wonderful group of people, um, very, very passionate. And it's a lifestyle. It, it's not just a, well, I'm going to go down and see the horse this afternoon and spend 20 minutes. It's not the way it works. Mm -hmm. These people live a lifestyle. Speak to that. Uh, uh, describe that. I mean, uh, you live, eat, and breathe your horses and the people associated with them. I mean, uh, our life, here's a perfect example. When my son has been married now 13 years, his wife is the trainer at our farm, one of two trainers. They scheduled their wedding and the births of their two children around show season. <laughs> really? <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. They got married in March before show season started in April. Yep. And yeah. the kids were born. Actually, Gavin got a little carried away. He was born May 1st. So <laughs> he went to his first horse show. A little too late. <laughs> but he was three weeks old. He went to his first horse show down in Raleigh, North yeah. Carolina. Yeah. So. Yeah. But Riley got it right. He was born on February 28th, long before show season started. <laughs> so. Now, the association... Uh, is the facilitator of meetings and conventions and shows, uh, exhibitions, I guess, right? Uh, not so much shows. Um, basically, uh, there's a, an overall entity that takes care of, of basic shows and, and licensing mm -hmm. of officials, judges, and whatnot. And that's USEF, the United States Equestrian Foundation. Mm -hmm. So, And that covers all breeds. And I mean, they're, uh, they're involved with the Olympics, everything. So. But what would be going on at some of these gatherings or convention meetings? Uh, well, we just had a convention, okay. and it was the first time we've done it. Uh, it was in Boston. I, was it January or February? February. I February. Think, yeah. uh, and it was um, it was the Saddlebreds, um, uh, the Morgans, the Hackneys, um, and uh, UPHA, the United Professional Horsemen's Association. That's an association specifically designed for the professionals the horse trainers and whatnot. And uh, we were in at the Western Waterfront in Boston, and uh, there were a whole series of seminars, um, educational seminars, uh, vendors where you could buy mer different merchandise. And, uh, and of course, we had, uh, we being the Morgans, had our own annual members meeting, which occurs once a year, because we are an incorporated entity. So how many get involved with that, for example? I think, uh, on a standalone Morgan convention, um, probably, depending on location, two to 400 mm -hmm. people will attend it. Mm -hmm. um, on, at this convention, I think it was probably a similar number, but because the other breeds were there, there were probably 1,000 people at the convention. Mm -hmm. So it was a lot of fun mm -hmm. and very educational, an, an awful lot of fun. Well, next year it's going to be in California. And uh, we're trying, the museum is trying to put together a, a panel now for, to uh, propose for that mm -hmm. conference where uh, we're going to be talking, we want to talk about the history of the Western working Morgan, mm -hmm. um, because there's several different kind of varieties and uses of Morgan horses. And it's a very interesting story about how Morgans got out west and how they spread throughout and worked on cattle ranches and sheep farms out west. And it's, it's just really, really fascinating. So yeah. these uh, Morgan horses uh, uh, and the, the owners, would you say that Many of them are solo owners, you know, single uh, horse owners or uh, small groups or major owners. How, how, how would you uh, I think define it's, that? I think it's spread across the spectrum of everything you just described, actually. I think there are quite a few farms out there that are the size of our family farm. I think there are a tremendous amount that have one or two horses in their backyard. And I don't think anybody is more passionate about it than the other. So I think yeah, it's... Yeah. Well, I think I was surprised the first time I went to a Morgan Horse Show because I had always grown up in, I grew up in Vermont, and I always saw the Morgan horses in people's backyards, overweight, <laughs> not overweight, but, but, you know, not, they don't, they're not as toned, and, and they have longer fur or hair, and, yeah. um, and, you know, so I was just really surprised at how, uh, how in shape they were, and how, you know, because I'm just so used to backyard horses in Vermont. <laughs> Jeff Gove, let's say that I was interested in the idea, the proposition of becoming a Morgan horse owner. Mm -hmm. where, where do I start? How do I begin? What type of an investment am I looking at? All depends on what... What should my expectations be? Well, all very good questions. The best thing to do 
is go to a local Morgan horse farm and talk to somebody who really knows the breed in and out and has been involved with it for a number of years. Um, you can also go on the AMHA website and get a, just uh, there's thousands of pages of information on the website. It's a lot of a lot of information on there, and then I think also if you contact yeah if you contact a local farm, there's listings of of um, farms that kind of offer. Uh, ways that you can visit or, you mm -hmm. know, get a sample <coughs> lesson or something like that. Um, also, the UVM Morgan Horse Farm in Middlebury, which is just down the road from the museum, they have a couple days, all, every Saturday in June, they have full days. So UVM has a dedicated program. Yes, they do. Yeah. And they, um, and they give tours of their facility, um, and, and they have uh, special event days throughout the Saturdays in June, and then they have a, a day in August where they invite people and they actually do demonstrations. So that's a really great opportunity to learn what a Morgan horse is, and, and you can actually speak with the trainers and the employees there and get up close and personal with them. Which is one of the reasons we uh, moved the museum to Middlebury, so that they could have the full experience, the history of the horse, plus see it live. And Steve Davis uh, runs the uh, horse farm at UVM, and he's just tremendously knowledgeable and just a wonderful guy, and he, he's more than happy to share very his knowledge, yeah. very much so. So, uh, Jeff, crunch the numbers for me. What type of uh, investment am I looking at here? Well, what do you want to do? You want to so. show a horse? You want to have them in your backyard? I mean, if you want to show a horse, you can lease a horse and be lease competitive. A horse. Sure, yeah. you can lease a horse at your local farm. You can uh, you can buy a horse. If you want a, just a real beginner, raw horse, green, green, you can get a horse for a couple of thousand bucks. Um, if you want a, a world champion, Mm. Sky's the limit. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. You want to spend a quarter of a million dollars? There's a horse out there for you. Yeah. And there's everything in between. So, I mean, uh, is it fair to say that many of the uh, owners who get started, uh, uh, I don't know, twenty-five to $50,000 is not uncommon? I don't is think that that's uncommon. I, I think it was a lot more common before the Great Recession. Yeah of 2008. I think that's colored everybody's expectations of life and the investments that they tend to make, just like the Great Depression did with my parents. You know, they, they probably still have this first nickel they ever made. Are you finding uh, interest and in, in new people coming into the uh, field of Morgan horses uh, or is ha has it uh, fallen off? How, how would you describe the Participation. I would say that the participation at um, at the association level has dropped dramatically over the last decade, and I think the turning point was the Great Recession. Uh, I also think it's generational. If you look at the demographics of the average Morgan participant, it's a woman, 42 to 52, and that age keeps growing. So it, it's interesting because I just read an article about uh, canine associations and shows. They're experiencing the exact same thing we are, mm -hmm. that the, this generation of people are starting to age out. Now, are we replacing them? We're trying at my farm, I can tell you that. And how are you going to get people in? The same way we get in. You've got to have a place to go and see a horse and touch them and ride them and fall in love with them because the breed is so friendly. This is the one breed when you walk in a barn, they're standing over the back corner with their head turned away, they hear somebody come in, the ears come up, they turn around, they walk to the front of the stall and, oh, hi. Really? Oh, yeah. really, really, really <laughs> very friendly. friendly. Yeah, very, yeah. very friendly. They're good, really. they're good for dog people. <laughs> <laughs> really. uh, we have a couple of minutes left. Yeah. Amy, this is a, a very impressive magazine that is put out, uh, what, uh, monthly? or It's nine times a year it nine comes out. Nine times a year. And it's, um, it's our, the official breed journal of the Morgan Horse, um, and it's put out by the American Morgan Horse Association. So it's called the Morgan Horse Magazine. And, and it, it's quite substantial. I it mean, is, uh, yeah. You know, so we, so. there's usually, a, there's a lot of show results and, and um, 
and information about shows, but there's also usually at least one history article in it, um, which are really fascinating. There was one recently about Laura Ingalls Wilder and her family. They had Morgan horses. Um, I do a little article. Um, well, uh, the magazine goes back many decades. Oh, yes. We have them right? uh, through the 1950s. So, and even there's a version of it that was even earlier than that. But um, I do the last page in I the, in the, um, in the magazine, I do a, a little article called Memorabilia, where I highlight an, um, something from the museum. Um, and I just, before we end, I really just wanted to plug that we have um, a new exhibit at the museum, and it's um, about Jeannie Mellon Herrick. Um, she was a well-known Morgan uh, artist, writer, uh, her husband was a trainer. They ran farms together, Morgan Horse Breeding Farms, and um, and so the and many people own paintings by her of their horses that they had commissioned, and she donated um, many paintings to the museum. So we have a, uh, an exhibit that's really great of all dedicated to, to her and her life work, and it opens on May 20th, Friday, May 20th, and um, so we hope people can come. It's going to run throughout the summer and the fall and um, it, it's a great opportunity to come to Middlebury to see the museum and then also maybe go out to the farm. So Amy Mincher, executive director of the American Morgan Horse Museum. National Museum of the Morgan Horse. Okay, yeah. so <laughs> we should consider this a personal invitation it's a from pers the yes, executive please director, right? The director, yeah. Please uh, come and visit me. Please so come. <laughs> and, and Jeff Gold from the president of the American Morgan Horse Absolutely. Association. Absolutely. We, we uh -huh. would love to have everybody show up at that. And, and I'm told that the governor, the, the, the former governor, will be there. So, well, and <laughs> any, any uh, maybe major the current governor? Any the current governor? <laughs> no, major maybe. shows coming up? Any major? Uh, uh, Let's see. What's next on the shows, show? Uh, agenda? Yes, the Greater Manchester. Sh uh, Greater Boston. It used to be Greater Manchester. Now I'm showing my age. So is uh, the end of the month. Mm -hmm. right. end, of, end of May. Yeah. Correct, and yeah, that'll yeah. probably have five or six hundred horses at it. Mm -hmm. That's an open breed show. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. around Fourth of July weekend, to, to plug Vermont things, there's um, um, the Heritage Days is at Tunbridge uh, mm -hmm. Fairgrounds, um, the World's Fairgrounds in Tunbridge, and that is, I think, Fourth of July weekend. I think that's correct. Um, and so that's a really great show for Vermonters or people visiting from Vermont to go to because it really shows uh, old-fashioned uh, history related uh, uses of Morgan. Well, I've got a gallop to the end of the show, so I want to thank <laughs> oh, my, <laughs> my guests, uh, Amy Mincher and Jeffrey Gove, and we've been talking about American Morgan horses, which are headquartered in the state of Vermont, in Shelburne, and in Middlebury, and this is Danny Frank for GNAT TV. So sweet to my fantasy treat. Sexier than lingerie, strong as a serrated blade, smart as can be, you'll think she had a PhD. One look in her eyes, and I'm mesmerized and hypnotized. She has class in the body of an hourglass. I know she's the one for me, it's her I want to please. No, I can't compare. Not a game of truth or dare. She got me going, going, going round and around.